So I recently did a video about the monolithic future of silicon, and I do believe monolithic, and as many of you called it, megalithic dyes have a huge future. It's not all going to be stacked together or be made of little chiplets. Some of the future will be made from megalithic dyes or semi-megalithic like NVIDIA is moving towards as well, where we can move as much as possible onto one established mature node with tons and tons of cache and memory and other features built into it. But the funny thing is this is really just solving the same problems that stacking and chiplets are trying to solve as well. You're trying to move as much as you can as closely as possible to not waste energy, to not waste time sending cues and electrons back and forth between different things on a PCB. You want everything as close as possible. One way to do that is, of course, through 3D stacking like, Invi like Intel and AMD are doing, you know, Fovros and, of course, the Zen architecture. But another way to do that is straight up to just make everything on a mature node. They're both trying to solve the same problem, though. Latency and wasted energy. But here's the thing. Large die sizes for peak efficiency just aren't going to make sense for most uses. Megalithic dies may have a future, but I don't think... I think they're going to be more niche. At least that's what's probably going to happen. And on the subject of megalithic dies... That Cerebris, you know, 46,000 millimeter squared piece of silicon, well impressive. Well, they say it's running customer workloads right now. It's not running at customers right now. They won't even tell us the clock speed. We have to stay tuned. But we don't even know what's going to come out next. So it still looks a little bit like it's a blurry future to me. Uh, so I guess we'll just have to see. And, of course, from... The hot chips event. We also know that Lisa Sue definitely doesn't believe in big dies at all. Back in the 2013-14 timeframe, you said, "Look, something has to change. You cannot keep doing just bigger and bigger monolithic chips. You can. I mean, you can do it. You just won't do it once." And of course, she's right. For most uses, megalithic dies are going to be niche. And over time, it's just not going to be sustainable, let's say, if NVIDIA really, really does insist on getting to, I believe they will make Ampere up to about 840 or something millimeters squared on Samsung's 7 nanometer EUV. It does get that big. Actually, Samsung's new 7 nanometer node gets a little bigger than TSMC's custom 12 nanometer node. So they're going to try, but it's just not going to scale at a certain point at least not quickly enough to get out the most efficient chip on time to beat your competition but if you have a niche use uh, this especially for something like asics and fpgas megalithic dies can be a big deal and as nodes mature if you get stuck on another node well i guess you can just make that 850 millimeter square die on seven nanometer if we're stranded not able to get to five nanometer like what happened going from 28 nanometer to 16 nanometer but again no the, the the majority of what will happen will be 3d stacked and be built on chiplets but i want to take the time to discuss the upheaval that might happen with massive performance increases as we move to more and more architectures built around 3D stacking and chiplets. Because what's going on right now is basically AMD and Intel with Fovros are just saying, oh, we can use chiplets. So what if we, if in AMD's instance, we put an IO die here and then put two core chiplets here? Oh my God, we just saved all this money and we can bend better. Or Intel going, well, our 10 nanometer sucks for yields, but we can make a single core yield, right? Yeah, we can, of course, yield, you know, microscopic, like, 40 millimeter squared dies and then put a 14 nanometer quad core behind it. Oh, my God. Our 10 nanometer issue isn't as big of an issue if we just run the first line of code on the newest node. But this is thinking very small. It's going to take time to realize the full performance gains that are possible when you build an architecture not around fixing problems you have with existing 2D architectures, but just completely around 3D stacking. And I think this is going to come in waves. 
I think right now we're looking at the first wave of chiplets, which is literally just the most simplistic thing you can do. Almost just proofs of concepts where, you know, you go, like I said, you just split up the I.O. from the cores or like Intel. You put one good core and a bunch of 14 nanometer cores in the background. That's thinking very small. But the next wave that's going to come is going to be the first wave that has things built into it around the idea that we're going to have good stacking and chiplet techniques. And that's going to probably be the first one, I think, will be Zen 4. You know, Zen 3 is going, okay, so now we're going to add even more chiplets because we can. We're adding, you know, HBM on package, and perhaps they'll split up the cores even a little more. But then Zen 4 is going to come, and it's going to be, no, this was built from the ground up with the idea that we can stack this. And I'll cover this in a video coming out soon, but TSMC talked about how in certain tests, you can get a 2000x performance increase if you stack certain chiplets the right way for one workload. This will be revolutionary for ASICs. And that even with modest workloads, we might be able to get 4 to 10x performance once we start building architectures completely around the idea of 3D stacking. So, yeah, it might not look that impressive with 3D stacking right away, right? You might have a situation where you're like, well, they have to clock them lower because of the thermal limitations and they're expensive and they're only useful on laptops. But that's the first wave we're going through now with Fovros and Zen 3. The next wave, Zen 4, could bring us doubling of performance again or even more in efficiency. And then the Zen 5 or Zen, probably Zen 6 wave, and the wave that's probably going to be Intel on 7 nanometer in 2022, 2023, is going to be the fully realized phase where they've worked out the bugs with like their Zen 4 and Fovros. And then they go, okay, we know what we're doing. We know what to focus on with a 3D stacked architecture. Here's a 10x in performance. In fact, as much as Moore's Law is dead, we might be celebrating the death of Moore's Law as we move forward towards new, better ways of doing things that we should have been trying to tackle years ago. So just keep that in mind. Prepare for those waves. And don't. And we will also solve the cooling thing. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't put, if, like, build the heat sink, like, kind of with, like, 3D stacking, 3D printing. Like, if you 3D stack, it, this is going to sound probably the wrong nomenclature, but, like, you 3D stack built, like, a die you could kind of 3d print in the copper cooling pipes through it right you have plumbing in a house that goes through the walls why can't we 3d print copper cooling pipes through the different stacks in a 3d stacked architecture that won't happen right away though that'll be the third or fourth wave but we will solve these problems and based on tsmc's presentation that should enable us to just scale performance in a way that we thought we'd never see again. So I really don't think silicon's going away anytime soon either. And because of 3D stacking and chiplets, we'll probably have situations where we're using graphene 3D nanotubes at the same time for the right components with silicon all stacked together. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. The next, like I say, the next decade is going to be crazy and prepare for the next waves of mega performance gains because I really do think they're coming. Thank God Moore's Law is dead. All right. Thank you for watching this video. I enjoyed making it. Please like it, share it, subscribe, ring the bell button, all the yada yada stuff. And please consider supporting me on Patreon where you can have in-depth discussions afterwards with me and other people who work in the industry. And of course, listen to Broken Silicon and Die Shrink. All right. Thank you, everybody.